نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وجعل لي وزيرا من أهلي رب يسر ولا تؤسر وتم بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاح رب زدني علما رب حب لي حكما وألحكني بالصالحين ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار یا اول الاولین یا آخر الآخرین یا دل قوت المتین یا رحم المساکین یا ارحم الرحمین حسبن اللہ و نعم الوکیل اللہم انہا نجعلک فی نحورہم و نعود بکا من شرورہم حسبن اللہ و نعم الوکیل رضیت باللہ ربا و بالاسلام دین و بمحمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم رسولا و نبیا آمین یا ارحم الرحمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ once again Alhamdulillah, by the grace and tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, today we are going to talk about ayah number 159 and ayah number 160 of Surah Ali Ibran, the third surah of the Quran. So we will first go over the recitation and the meaning. So, a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Raheem. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ فَاعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ فَبِمَا سُو Fa is so, bima, because, rahmatin, of, uh, so because of mercy, minallahi, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, linta lahum. Linta is like uh, something soft to deal, um, so here it is used in a sense of, you dealt gently, you are very gentle, lahum, with them. Walau, and if, kunta, you had been, meaning if you were not soft, and rather you had been, fadhan, fadhan, is uh, rude and we will go over all the all these words in a bit more detail later for one rude ghali the qalbi you have been rude and you had been harsh uh, harsh uh, at the heart meaning hard-hearted ghali the qalbi very hard at the heart lan faddu they would have dispersed uh, lam here is lam of taqi meaning definitely surely an faddu they would have dispersed min hawlik from around you. Hawl is around and ka is you. And you here, it, uh, the ayah is talking to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would have dispersed from you. Fa'fu anhum. Then pardon. Fa'fu is to pardon. And um, fa'fu, uh, afa, afu is another a kind of pardon in which something is totally removed. Like ghafara is pardoning too, but fa'fu, like afia is to pardon in a way that no traces are seen as well. So for example, if there's something on the road, let's say, and you cover it, and something on the ground and you cover it, you can still see a, the thing that's covered, but you can still see a bump that something was here at some time before. But afia is to remove something totally. You can't even see that something was there. So forgive in a way that like it's fafu um, afia is to forgive in a way that no traces even remain that there was something at some point. So fafu and whom then pardon, from them was taghfir lahum and seek forgiveness for them meaning make dua to allah for forgiveness for them washawir hum and to mashwara with them meaning uh, consult them shawir hum fill amr in the matter meaning take consultation from them discuss matters with them everything for ida then meaning after you have done your discussions and everything then ida when meaning the ida is the future when when this happens then this way right? then when azamta you have decided you have made a decision fatawakkal ala allah then tawakkal to have tawakkul to have trust uh, ala allah on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in allah indeed allah indeed god yuhibbu he loves ha ba and ba is hub is love he loves al mutawakkilin he loves those who have tawakkul in him those who who are the people of uh, having tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala make us of those whom he loves. Right? And so in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he's saying, so O Prophet, it is through mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are gentle to them. Had you been rough and hard-hearted, they would have dispersed from around you. 
so pardon them and seek forgiveness for, uh, for them. Consult them in the matter, and once you have taken a decision, place your trust in Allah. Surely Allah loves those who place their trust in him. And in the next ayah, continuing from this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, in, if yansurkum uh, helps you, all of you, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if Allah helps all of you, fala ghaliba lakum, then, um, uh, not ghaliba overcome lakum for you. Then basically what that means is then there is no one who can overcome you. If Allah helps you, then no one can overcome you. Wa in and if yakhdulkum, uh, yakhdulkum, kha, dal and lam, he forsakes you, he leaves you. Faman, then who, dalladi, is the one who yansurukum, who can help you min ba'dihi, after him. May Allah Ta'ala not make us of those who he ever forsakes. May Allah Ta'ala uh, be with us for every second of every life. And he may he not leave us even for the blink of an eye. Wa Allahi and on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fal yatawakkal. Let put their trust. Al mu'minun, the believers. So basically on Allah alone, let the believers put their trust. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if Allah helps you, there is no one to overcome you. And if he abandons you, then who is there to help you after that? Who can help you after that? In Allah, the believers should place their trust. So in these ayat, um, again, this ayat we know as uh, as we know, this is continuing from the Battle of Uhud and that whole passage is continuing and different conversations are taking place. Allah subhanahu wa is teaching us different things through what is happening around and everything. And now in this ayah, we are learning a lot about the qualities of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like? And why was he like this? And what did he do? And what is the lesson from uh, for us in our dealings with people especially? Uh, in our uh, in our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in our dealings with people. So there are many, many, many lessons in, in these two ayat. And um, may Allah ta'ala help us to uh, to understand and to implement uh, those in our life. So the qualities of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa are mentioned and the status of sahabas is also mentioned. Like, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned twice already in the passage that he has forgiven them. Like yes, they did a mistake. And it was a genuine mistake and that mistake led to a lot of harm. People who left the archers, who left the mountain, the people who were starting to have doubts, the people who were uh, overtaken by the chaos and they they kind of lost their heart for a few minutes and everything. So the, the mistakes happened during that battle and everything and a lot of loss happened because of those battles. And yes, it was a mistake and it needs to be corrected, it needs to be called out. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he has forgiven them. Right? So that no one can say anything against them until the day of judgment. Right. So first thing is that before anybody points any fingers at any of the Sahaba, we have to be extremely uh, respectful when we talk about the companions of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because they were a special lot. They were they were people chosen by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and uh, we have to be very careful in the words we speak about the people who are close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala because um, you know like those are the people close to Allah, and then. Uh, we have to be careful for anybody who's close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if they make mistakes and everything, we and we are all human, uh, we, we always watch our tongue of what we say, right? And if we think of times like this, like something that has happened like this, usually when something's hurt and usually something negative, our, our negative side or our anger comes out when something's hurt. So for example, uh, for us, for any human being, it's very hard to, to tolerate any uh, any hurt which is on our body. So for example, let's say a child is run, running around and the child steps on uh, a mother's toe and it hurts badly, right? And then we react automatically. We react without thinking, what did you do? Oh my God, my head. it hurts so much and everything. And then like we get, we get angry and we get frustrated all of us. It's very hard. Like it's just automatic reaction sometimes, right? Or, uh, or like, uh, so, so these things happen, right? But if we look at the Prophet ﷺ, what has happened is that in this battle of Uhud, he was hurt himself and not just uh, a little bit. He was hurt quite badly. He fainted. He's like uh, there was a um, like his, his teeth were broken uh, to that point. He was bleeding profusely like they had to do a lot of things to stop the bleeding and everything. So his face is all has a lot of like basically you can think of his face as a lot of bandages and everything he has. A, he's in a lot of physical pain himself and there is a lot of emotional pain as well because they had disobeyed the they had disobeyed him. His followers had disobeyed him 
and also there is an there's a lot of pain because his uncle and uh, his very beloved uncle and his many beloved sahabas have been killed and not just killed their bodies have been mutilated and everything so it was expected that at this time he would be upset and he would be angry with with the sahabas but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the prophet sallam to retain his kindness meaning like whatever has happened has happened like don't don't say anything to them now right but also right what we are also seeing is that um you know like um, um sorry so what, what we're also seeing is all these strong ayat before this if you think what is happening like all these ayat before in which the uh, the mistakes were being called out you did this you were running away from the battle and you were doing this and everything now the experience of the sahabas with the quran is different from the experience that me and you have with the quran right? we we are just reading the quran we are learning the quran we are trying to find out but for the sahabas the wahi would have come would come to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then he would recite it out to the people. So it was very hard for the companions of the Prophet وسلم, to separate the Quran from the Prophet. So the Prophet وسلم, is speaking these ayat. So even those previous ayat, which are which are very strong uh, and which are calling them out, which are which are pointing at that, okay, this is what you did and this is what you shouldn't have done, though Allah has forgiven you, but this is this, this, this is what you did and everything. And so it's it's literally calling them out and their mistakes and everything. But those ayat, how are they experiencing it? The Prophet himself is speaking those ayat. He's speaking those words from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as he's speaking those words, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa while he's speaking those words, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full right to say things, to correct people and everything. But on the inside, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he has so much love and rahmah, loving care and mercy for his, his uh, people, his followers, his companions, that even though he's saying all these ayat inside he's and uh, inside he's feeling like this love for the people inside he's like he just wants to go and hug them and he was like it, it's all okay you know like and everything so he's feeling he has this softness inside which is uh, which is almost unusual which is like um, uh, we don't see that kind of softness for people so he allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for bima rahmatim min allah like because of a special mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ma here is a, a ma of tajub, of emphasis. Like it is a special rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are like this. The Prophet ﷺ, this was a special quality that he was like this. He had this special love. Even when he is reading the ayat inside and the sahabas while listening to this, they are feeling scared, they are feeling guilty, they are feeling embarrassed. And they are like, uh, you know, like we have disappointed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have even disappointed the Prophet sallallahu So they have all these feelings going on inside. They are like embarrassed to like look in the, the Prophet sallallahu in the eye or like just like to be, have an eye contact or to everything. They're so embarrassed and they're just sitting there, right? They love him a lot. And they're feeling all this, all these feelings of guilt and feelings of embarrassment and everything. But the Prophet ﷺ, on the other hand, inside, he is feeling this extreme rahmah. And nobody knows this, but Allah knows the hearts. He is feeling this extreme love and care for his companions. He's like, oh my God, they must be feeling bad. Like I, he wants to, he wants to just like um, tell them, no, it's okay and everything. And if we compare that even to the other prophets uh, uh, and their relationship with their followers, for example, Yunus alayhi salam, he got frustrated at one point and um, he left and he was swollen, um, um, he was swallowed by the, uh, sorry, he was swallowed by the whale and everything and we know the whole story and everything the um the the like uh, the story of jonas the yunus salam, right so we know that story and he, he actually left his people he got so frustrated these people are not listening and he left and then later on allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought him back and his people had believed musa salam, when his people would trouble him so much he would read the dua um that ya allah like uh, don't make me one of the jahili make me meaning don't let me control my anger don't make me angry um don't don't uh, let my emotions overpower me and everything right so he's making this dua, so he's frustrated with them. Nu alayhi salam, he made this dua that, uh, yeah, Allah, separate me from these people. These people are like, um, you know, so he's making all these duas for people. Yaqub alayhi salam, his own sons, they he loves them a lot. And he they, um, you know, like they uh, they they did what they did to their brother uh, Yusuf. But then um, later on, uh, when the brothers asked him that, um, uh, his sons asked him that, uh, when they confessed to everything what they had done to Yusuf, and they asked him, 
can you make dua for us? He said, I will make dua for you. Like he's so hurt that he said, okay, I will make dua. Like he, he could can't bring himself to make dua right now because he's so hurt. And these are all uh, these are all natural human responses that all of us have. Like when we are hurt, when we are angry, it takes us some time to get over that. And we we have these feelings and uh, it's it's natural. It's human emotion. But the Prophet Sallallahu there was a special Rahma of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that his heart was so different. His heart was totally unique that in fact his heart was, um, you know, he was he, he was like uh, he had this extreme love for not just uh, the companions, but everybody like the whole humanity and especially for his companions and the believers. He had this special love and everything. And through this ayah, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala done, he's revealed what's going on inside the heart of the Prophet. So as uh, the Prophet uh, is reading out the ayat of um, the Quran. In those ayat before, the conversation is happening between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the companions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the companions through the mouth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And now he shifts the conversation to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and talks to him while the companions are listening. Now this conversation did not have to be in public. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have told these things to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a, a wahi, as a separate thing. It didn't have to be a part of the Quran, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it that and there is hikmah in that, right? So he is saying this in front of everybody. And now as the Sahabas are having all these emotions inside, they are now shocked to listen to this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing what's going inside the heart of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? And we know how, how he was. We know that even the people who hurt him so much, even the hypocrites in Medina who hurt him so much, who, who made up scandals against his own family members, who who tried to even get him killed, who tried to side with the other side and everything. Even the leader of those hypocrites, Abdullah bin Obey, when he passed away, the Prophet ﷺ went and prayed janazah even for him, just because his son requested the Prophet ﷺ, he went and prayed janazah for Abdullah bin Ubay even. When the ayah came for the hypocrites that, um, O Prophet, at a later stage in the seerah, even if you pray for them 70 times now, Allah Ta'ala is not going to forgive them because they have they have done some extremely wrong things and everything. And what did the Prophet say? ﷺ, okay, then I will pray 71 times, right? So it, it's like... Um, you know, and, and we hear so many things like um, there's, there was one incident when there is a woman who committed zina, meaning who committed adultery outside of marriage. She was a married woman and she committed adultery. And we know the punishment and everybody makes such a, um, you know, th this is something which has made so much controversial and people talk about this so much. Uh, oh, my God, Islam is so harsh and everything that uh, the punishment of a woman who's married, who um, or a man who's married and has a relationship outside the marriage it has a physical relationship outside the marriage and everything and either they themselves confess it or they uh, there are witnesses there are four witnesses to this and the punishment for that is rajam to, to be stoned right and and again this punishment is not just to be given out by anybody it is when there is a proper khilafa there are things maintained there is a um, and there's a proper way to do this so there's a lady who actually committed this and she came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam herself uh, because she was like she was scared she didn't want to punish me she sought forgiveness from allah and she wanted to get the punishment in this life so that she's not punished in the hereafter so she came to the prophet sallallahu and she said that ya rasulullah like um, I, this this happened and please punish me and the prophet sallallahu said no 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 go away and everything uh, come later Come later and then she went and and basically the prophet ﷺ was like she it was a private conversation and the reason he said was okay maybe like he said he took sent her away there were no other witnesses and everything so there was nothing he was so merciful he didn't want her to be punished and everything and the so he's like no no go away go away and then she came back after some time and he said okay but she was pregnant and he said um no, 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 you're pregnant. So we, we, uh, so no, go, go away. We are not, uh, just go, it's fine. And then she came and, uh, with the baby in her uh, hand a few months later. And then she's like, okay, Ya Rasulullah, punish me now. Meaning she's asking for a death penalty for herself. And what did the Prophet say? No, 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 go. It's like the child needs you. you feed the child. And you need to feed the child, meaning not just one or two days. That means two years, uh, right? And uh, so she, she went and then she came back after two years. And uh, she came back with a piece of bread in the hand of the child uh, while he's eating. And she came again to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, OK, Ya Rasulullah, grant me the punishment now. And now she didn't come in private conversation. She came in public, like when there were other people around as well. So now like the 
the law had tied him and then uh, she was given that punishment. But what we are what we are learning is when we actually see the seerah, it's like the Prophet ﷺ was so loving to his people. He was so kind and there was a special kind of loving care and mercy. He wanted goodness for all of us. He didn't he didn't rush to punish anybody. He didn't rush to be harsh to anybody. He was extremely soft and kind. And when there was no other option available, then he would um, then there would be some punishment or something happened. So we can just to understand, we can imagine that let's say there's a mother, some a child does something wrong and, and something and she tries that um, the father doesn't get angry, right? So she would she would say uh, convey to the father in a way that she would talk this and that. So she doesn't want the father to get angry on the child. So she makes effort for that and everything, right? So uh, because of the love that she has for the child, right? So so here we're understanding that um, you know this is a special mercy, special mercy from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that linta lahu. You deal gently with them. Linta from comes from line which is like uh, in Arabic that means um, a date that is um, that is very soft that is very soft and uh, so sometimes let's say we go out and we buy some dates they look good but when we come home it's very hard on the inside and everything but some dates what what happens is when we buy them and we eat them and they are so soft that they literally melt in the mouth and the softest dates are usually the sweetest dates too right so the word line the word linta lahum the it, it describes the quality of the prophet that he was extremely soft extremely kind and this is a quality of a leader a ustad a murabbi uh, a, the one who's doing the tarbiyah of another person right uh, uh, somebody who's teaching a teacher has should have this uh, quality may allah grant that to all of us right so it is from the special mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is so soft with people he's so gentle with people right and the rahmatin is nakira meaning like um, uh, it is wide uh, rahmatin at the end so just for the grammar uh, part at the end it's nakira meaning it is uh, it is not specific it's common meaning it's uh, it's wide it's encompassing right so sometimes we say the book and sometimes we say book right so uh, when we say book it could be any book but when you say the book we make it specific just this book only right so this is general it's like rahma it's not like uh, just a little bit of rahma. It's like wide encompassing. So it's like a huge rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is. The Prophet is like this. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And the opposite of that. And if he was not this soft, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kunta fadlan. And if you had been rude, fadl, fa, wa, and wa. Uh, fadl means somebody who um, is the opposite of soft. And if he was not soft, what could he have been like? If there was a possibility, he could have been fadwan means crude, impolite, harsh, ill-mannered. Fadd, the word actually comes from the dirty water which is inside the intestines. So in the desert, what would happen is, let's say the when the Arabs would be traveling and everything, let's say somebody was traveling by themselves. They had um, a, a ride, an animal that they were riding on, um, let's say a camel or they, they're riding on that. And it's so hot and they don't get any food or something. They're traveling for a long time and the animal dies. Now, when the animal dies, they're stuck in a place. They can't move and everything. And now there is no water. There's no food. Everything's run out. And this person now he's at the uh, now the, he's struggling to survive. Now, what the people do at that time is um, and and it it, it, it is very um, it is not a very pleasant thing to think of, but it is for the survival. Uh, a person in a desert knows they, they need to do this to survive is they they need to cut the animal open and they need to, um, uh, you know, like th there's inside the intestines, there is some water of the animal, but this is not clean water. This is um, disgusting, disturbing kind of a liquid, but they have to to survive. They can't even cut the animal open in a way that uh, everything spills over. So they have to actually drink from the stomach, from the intestines, and to survive, they have to do that, which is very disturbing, right? So, um, so they have to drink directly from the animal's intestine, and this is this is not pleasant. This is unpleasant. This is disgusting. This is disturbing, and everything. So, fadwan, um, coming from that, fadwan is a kind of behavior of a person that is crude, that is impolite, that is dis disturbing, that is not that is not pleasant at all. That is like mm, like you, you don't you don't you don't like it. Right? So and also even if a person is not generally abusive or harsh, sometimes 
just one word or one gesture could make another person feel so like they can make somebody else feel so, um, you know, like um, um, so unappreciated. So um, you can make somebody feel bad just by one word or one gesture or something. And this is not how the Prophet ﷺ was like. He was extremely soft and he was extremely gentle. And the thing is, in today's day and age, we uh, we talk about um, if somebody is very soft, people talk, oh, you're so soft or oh, you are like this or oh, people can just take you for a ride or oh, you're like as if it's a weakness to be soft, as if it is something very to be looked up to something. Somebody is very harsh or oh, you know what? If somebody tells me one thing, I can tell them 10 things and you know, like nobody can stand in front of me and people feel proud about that. But our Prophet وسلم, when we learn from him, he was not like that, right? So it is a special blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when his heart was soft. And it is also a special blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on anybody whose heart is soft, whose heart is soft and uh, whose behavior is good, who is kind to people, who's soft to people, who's gentle to people, who's well-mannered to people. So the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, walau kunta fadlan, if you were, if you had been rude. And another thing is, ghalid al-qalbi. You had been hard hearted. You had been, um, you know, like um, uh, something hard. Like, for example, there is honey. And after some time, the honey crystallizes. If you leave honey for a while and it, it gets crystallized, so it becomes hard, right? It, and it, it's hard to use it then because it's uh, crystallized and everything. So a heart that is hard, that has become, um, that does not have any softness in that, that is stern, that is just uh, absorbed by their own selves. What happens is that that kind of a heart, they don't, their ability to sympathize or empathize with others is not there anymore. And their anger on somebody, just because like somebody did some mistakes or something, the ang their anger is so big that they cannot bring themselves to be kind to them. They're like, oh no, I don't, about that person, don't even tell me anything. Like I, I'm done with, with that person. He did this. Now I, now I cannot speak nicely about that person ever in my life. Every time I speak about him or her, there has to be something negative coming out of my mouth. Audhu Billah, may Allah protect it, us from that, right? So, uh, such. So, for example, let's say um, somebody comes and say, if the Prophet system had been like this, let, let's say a scenario, if he had been like this, what if, um, you know, like somebody comes to the Prophet system after they had done a mistake and they said, uh, Ya Rasulullah, and he would reply, Yeah, what? What do you want? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm sorry. And then what if he had replied, what sorry? Go from here. I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to talk to you. Just go right now. And he would have had every right to do so. And we would imagine him to do so when somebody has done a lot of wrong. But we never see that in the Sira. Never. For even once, we never see in the Sira him being harsh to anybody. Him being, um, uh, you know, like uh, even in the toughest, the most painful situations, he was very soft and gentle. To the people right he was not taunting he was not rude he was not like okay i forgive you but like okay I, you know like whatever like he was never like that never taunting rude ordering other people and everything now um, just a little disclaimer here this this um yes we are talking what is his behavior like this we're talking about a serious mistake done by some people uh, but they are genuinely nice people they are good people. They are on the right path. And we are not talking about serial offenders or abusers or munafikeen or fasikeen. Like the, the people who are, um, we don't we don't take from this that um, in our life, even if somebody is abusive, if somebody is uh, uh, continuously harming other people, we have to still be soft with them. And we have to still be like, whenever they say sorry, we say, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And then two days later, they start the same behavior again. And then after that, they, um, you know, like they, they come and say sorry again, and we forget everything and we let them continue. No, our our religion never, never asks for us to allow uh, ourselves to be abused either. Right. So if somebody is on that pattern and we, we see that pattern, then it is okay to distance ourselves a little bit from them. Right. It's OK to distance ourselves slightly from them, whatever is possible that, uh, you know, we don't want to be abused. We, we, our religion doesn't tell us to harm ourselves. At the same time, if somebody has is generally good and they have made a mistake or something, then uh, there is no harm in forgiving them and moving on. Right. And giving them another chance. Right? Even if they don't appreciate that chance, there's no harm in us giving them another chance. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us that softness in our heart, to give them another chance and to to forgive and forget. Forgive uh, forgive doesn't mean that you keep taunting every time. Yes, I forgave you, but you remember you did this 
and everything. No, forgive and forget meaning you don't even mention it again. You you don't even mention it. You meant as if that didn't exist, as if they never did that mistake and you carried on, right? But if you were like this, Allah SWT is saying, if you had been fadlan gharid al-qalbi, then what would have happened? Lan faddu min hawlik. Then they would have dispersed from you. Fadd, faddan comes from fa, dod, and dod, which means shattering away from you. So let's let's imagine, let's say there's a glass and it, it falls down and it shatters. It, it, it spreads all over. It goes all away, away, right? It was one before, but once it breaks, it shatters all over. So, so the people were one before, but if you had been rude, if you had been taunting all the time, sarcastic all the time, and like always pointing out to other person's mistakes all the time and everything, even if they were close once, even if they you had love between each other once, even if you are correct, they would have shattered away from uh, from you. That's a that's a human nature, right? That um, infidad means when a glass breaks and shattered away. So the people would have shattered away from you. Now the Sahaba, if you look at the prophet, uh, the companions of the Prophet they they would they were ready to sacrifice their lives for him. They were like bees around honey, right? And they are uh, they are they were like this with the Prophet because what Allah Taala is teaching us because because it was. The heart of the Prophet Sallallahu that makes them all one, that makes them unbreakable, right? Not like the glass uh, pieces that shatter all over, but but all together. And how were they like this? Because it's a, uh, you know, he was so kind for them. His heart was like this and they, they could relate to it. He was so soft to them, so gentle with them, so loving with them. Like there, there are several incidents that are recorded. So, for example, one time at the time of Hudaybiyah, uh, uh, later on in the Sira, a man came from the side of the Quraysh to uh, to talk to the uh, to the Muslims and to kind of negotiate and uh, some diplomatic talks. Basically, he came for that, and uh, in their heads, in in the heads of the people of Arabia at that time, loyalty came from tribes. Loyalty came from we are loyal to each other if we are of the same family, if we belong to the same tribe, then we are loyal to each other, then we do things for each other, then we stand up for each other. Otherwise, like otherwise, why would I stand for some um, for somebody? Why would I do something, go out of my way and do something for somebody who's not from my family or not from my tribe? But here, when he came here, he saw people from different nationalities. Somebody is Roman, somebody is Persian, somebody is, um, you know, like uh, some there, there are slaves, former slaves there, there are millionaires there, there are people who are rich, poor, every kind of people there. And then they're they're together. And he saw all these Sahabas and he saw the love that these Sahabas, these companions had for their prophet. And he went back after he had these negotiate talks and everything. He went back to the people, to the Quraysh, and he said to them, that to the effect that I have seen many big, big kings. I have been to the palaces of the uh, um, Caesars and the Khusros and everything. And I have I've seen all kind of big emperors and basically people who are big deals. But the kind of love that I have seen the companions uh, of the prophet have for him, I have not seen that kind of a love anywhere. He, when Even when he goes to do voodoo, even when he goes to go and wash his face, these companions, they fight with each other to catch the drops of water falling from his face. This kind of love I have not seen anywhere. This kind of love I have not seen for any, even big, big emperors. So you cannot, uh, you cannot break these people. They have the kind of love for him that is unprecedented. In, and, and it goes both ways. He also had the kind of love for his people, for us, for me and you. Uh, like he used to pray. He was... Um, you know, like me and you are born in this time. We have never seen him, but he knew the people who are going to come in his ummah till the end of the times, the people who were, will be born into Muslim families or the people who will accept Islam. And then he knew about them and he would make dua for me and you every single night to the point that he would cry and make dua to Allah, Ya Allah, Ummati, Ummati, my ummah, my people, my people. For me and you, he would make dua so much in the night and he would cry so much in the night for people who are not even born yet. Right? We can't even make that much dua for our own children. He made that dua for me and you, which we are not even born yet, and he was making dua for us so much so. He would pray so much so and he would cry and make dua so much so that he, his legs would get swollen uh, in the night while standing and praying so much. 
and these were all voluntary prayers. He, these, was, these were not compulsory prayers. Like these were not the five prayers of the day. These were additional prayers in the night when he would stand up in the night and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are several other incidents. Like one of the incidents, one time the Prophet heard a sound outside his house. And when he heard a sound outside his house, he looked out and he said, okay, like there's somebody walking and everything. So a, a companion and he asked, why are you here or at this time in the night? And you know what this companion replied? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I did not feel like leaving. There were so many people around you in the day. And this time, like after everybody left, I felt that maybe if you need something, if you need anything and you call out, I wanted to be make sure that someone is here. So I wanted to be here just in case you need anything, you know, just so I, I just wanted to be around um, here because and, and the Prophet made dua for him, right? One time the Prophet ﷺ was in the masjid and there was a group of people that he was talking to and Umar he was entering, he was outside somewhere and he was coming to the masjid and he was entering. And while he was entering, he heard the Prophet ﷺ say, OK, uh, stand up and stay. Um, and the Umar, anhu, he stopped and stood right there with one foot inside the masjid and one foot outside the masjid. And then after after some time, another person came there and asked Umar, why are you standing like this? You know, why are you standing like this? One feet inside the masjid and you're like not even moving. You're standing like this. And Umar, he replied that, you know, the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I heard him saying that stand up. So I, I just stopped right here and I'm, I'm standing and I, and I won't move until like he tell me. So the person said, you know, the Prophet was not talking to you. He was talking to some other people who he was talking to. And Umar said, oh, OK, I thought he was saying to me, so I, I can't move, obviously, when the Prophet asked. Uh, so what if he had said to me, so I couldn't move, right? The kind of love that they had for the Prophet was unprecedented. One time, one of the companions of the Prophet, mm -hmm. he got a melon to eat, right? He got a melon and he was not eating it. And people saying, OK, why are you not eating it? Why are you not eating the melon? And he said, you know, I, I, I was just remembering and I was not sure how did when the Prophet ﷺ got a melon to eat, in what way did he cut it and eat it? So because I wanted to eat the same way. So he was not eating a melon just because he wanted to make sure he eats a melon in the way that the Prophet ﷺ would, uh, would eat. Like the kind of love they had was different kind of love and the kind of love that may Allah Ta grant us that kind of love as well for our Prophet ﷺ. The kind of sacrifices that he has made because of which me and you have Islam today is um, is something that we can never thank him enough for. Right. And so why did these people love him so much? And the answer is here. The answer is in this ayah because love is a two way street. He loved his companions a lot, too. He loved them so much. His heart was so soft for them. He was so gentle with them. He was not harsh with them. He would not tell them off. He would not give them silent treatment for days if if he didn't like one small thing about them. Right? He wouldn't he wouldn't be harsh to them. If anybody ever gave him a gift, he would receive it. Even if it was a stone from anywhere, he would he would take it. If anybody asked for help, he would never refuse it. He would always help his family in the chores in the house. Right? He would he would always be be doing things for people. He would always be kind to people. And even when somebody does mistakes, he would he would not be calling them out for every little thing that they did. He would be extremely kind and forgiving. Everyone thought that he loved them the most. Right? We, we cannot even do this with like two or three children that both the children think that we love them the most. But he was dealing with so many companions and everyone thought that he loved them the most. That was how what his behavior was, right? And what Allah Ta'ala is teaching us is no matter how good we are, even if we love somebody, even if we love somebody a lot, and even if we are a good person, if we are rude, if we are insensitive, if we put others down, if we insult them, if we make fun of them, People will slowly leave your side and some people might not leave you physically, but they will start to leave you emotionally because you insult them. You put them down. You are insensitive towards them. You don't care about their feelings. You don't care about, uh, um, uh, you know, like uh, their honor, their respect in front of other people, right? You you keep disrespecting them once, twice, thrice and everything, then uh, it's human nature, right? People will not. Uh, and then then we wonder why is this happening, right? So people might keep standing because of respect or because of a certain relationship, but their hearts will not be there anymore. So for example, let's say somebody has some servants and everything, and they are very rude to their servants. They keep calling them 
in in loud noises they keep calling them off they keep telling them like uh, nasty things oh you are so so useless you're this and that because now the servant has to work for the master he needs the money he or she needs the money so they have to listen to the person saying all these things but what we have to understand is when we are saying to somebody when we are screaming on somebody and they don't have they're not in a position to reply back to us they might be saying the same things to us in their own heart though they might be saying those same things to us in their own hearts, but they don't have just because they don't have the ability to do that. But our behavior has an impact on other people. Right? So even if it's our children, even if it's our maids, even if it's the people who are um, who do not have the power to speak in front of us, the Prophet Sallallahu is teaching us by example and Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala is uh, making sure that we understand that his example is that we need to control our tongues. We need to control our tongues. The Prophet ﷺ told us to the effect of that that person is saved who learns to be quiet, who learns to control their own tongue, right? And so here also the Prophet ﷺ is being told that Allah Subhanahu is telling the Prophet, and by extension all of us, he's telling the Prophet that your lenient attitude towards them should continue in future also. Yes, the mistake of Uhud were big, but don't let the mistakes of Uhud um, harden your attitude towards them. Your leniency will make them lovingly follow you and turn to self-reform. They will, they will look at themselves more. The more you're lenient, the more you're soft at them, they will themselves look at their own selves and try to uh, try to correct themselves. You don't have to point out everything, right? They will, if you are soft with them, if you are kind with them, they will look at their own mistakes and they will correct themselves, right? So uh, people in, in our own lives, people will make mistakes. Sometimes they will make huge mistakes. Sometimes those mistakes will kill us inside. Sometimes the mistakes will make us so angry, so hurt on the inside. But sometimes intelligence is to be quiet at that time, right? The intelligent person is some that when we are out of this situation, when we are alone, when we are one on one with the other person, and when we know that the other person is in the mental zone to actually listen to us, there's no point in talking otherwise, right? So then you share and, and you, you let them know, but in a nice kind um, way, right? For us, um, so for example, if you're talking about, um, let's say somebody's child doesn't have a good company, like that their company is not good and everything, and uh, uh, or, or or any other relationship in, in our life, like the, let's say they, they've fallen into bad company, they've fallen into bad company and everything. Now, if we we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them out of the bad company, but we cannot just go and tell them, okay, no, your friends are so, 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 so. Why? Because for us, it might be just their friends, but for them, because they've fallen into that bad company, they look up to this person, even if this person is nasty, um, bad for them. But for them, this other person is more important than the prime minister, right? So there's no point in, in saying that, right? And sometimes, especially in, let's say, relationships, sometimes, a lot of the times, relationships are saved when one party at least be quiet. When one person's angry, the, the Prophet ﷺ told us uh, that in a marriage, when the husband is angry, the wife should be quiet. When the wife is angry, the husband should be quiet. Right? Meaning, when one person's angry, then uh, saying something to them, re keep responding to them or everything, is, is only going to escalate the matters further. So it's better if the other person stays quiet for that time and, okay, let them, let them get over their anger and everything, and then things would be normal again. Everything and every every little thing, every little thing that we hear, we don't have to respond to every uh, everything, right? For um, for some questions, we know if we actually respond, the response is going to be strong, and it might it might sting the other person. They they're not ready to listen to the truth, right? So might as well hold your tongue. And um, the it is told we we learn in Abadin to hold your tongue. Sometimes we have to hold our tongue many times in a day, and that that is okay. That is not some a weakness. That is a strength. Right? The Prophet ﷺ told us in a hadith that strong is not the person who has to the effect that strong is not the person who has muscles or who can build heavy weight, who can lift heavy weights or who can who can like basically wrestle others and um, and you know like who can even like uh, be has some, some such cutting words that he can like just insult anybody or he can overpower anybody in speech. No, strong is the person who can control their own anger. That is what the Prophet ﷺ told us. The strength lies when you can control your own anger. And you can be above that and behave in a better way still. Right. So and the bigger the heart is, the more we are, a person's able to forgive and move on. If your heart is small, you cannot forgive tiniest of things. But if your heart is big, you can forgive big, big things and move on. 
right? And uh, the bigger a person is, like, and and big big doesn't mean by age or by uh, social status or by money or anything. Big means the heart is big. Then that person can actually move on. And leadership in Islam. Uh, has a totally different concept than leadership at other places. Leadership in Islam means a person who is serving their their group, their community, their whatever. So a scholar was once asked, why do you stay up so much in the night? And like, uh, why do you stay up so much? Why do you put yourself into so much hardship and everything? So basically he was he would do a lot of ibadah, a lot of worship, a lot of study and everything. So what did he reply? He replied, I stay up so much so that others can sleep, meaning what what did he mean by that? Meaning he would study a lot so that if anybody has any questions, he was able to answer them to the best of his ability. So if 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 I don't study, then other people will have to basically look for the answers here and there. So I study a lot so that I'm able to answer so that that other people are able to sleep, right? So a, a, a person who's we are all and another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu told us we are all shepherds. We are all each one of us has people who are in our care. Like a husband has the wife and the children in his care. A mother has the children in her care. A teacher has the students in the care. A group leader has a group in the care and the employer has the employee under the care. And so we are all shepherds and we are responsible for our flock. We are responsible for the people. We will be asked about the people who are under our care. How did we behave with them? What did we do with them? Right. And um, how did we take care of them? And the qualities of a leader in, in whichever situation it is, is the qualities that we learn is one, they're soft spoken, they're soft spoken. Inside, they have a lot of concern for for them. Like they have um, they have this deep concern inside. Where are where are my people going? Where are these people? They don't ever go like, yeah, let them do whatever you do. You I do my whatever I feel like doing and it's all good. No, inside they have a lot of concern that ya Allah, uh, my people, my family, my my people, uh, if they're doing anything wrong, if they are, if somebody is missing their prayers, it, it, it kills you inside. It, it should kill you inside if somebody is. Uh, missing their prayer. somebody you love is missing their prayer and doesn't even bother you then you don't love them you don't really love them right so you you and somebody doesn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala somebody is not somebody who's our close uh, friend our relative our family member who's not a Muslim yet and doesn't bother us we don't want them to um, to learn about Islam to everything there's something wrong right so whether the Prophet Sallallahu and uh, through him we are learning that have a lot of he had in his heart, he had so much concern for people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to tell him, Ya Rasulullah, will you kill yourself out of gum for people, out of concern for people? Your job is only to convey the message. You cannot make anybody do. Everybody has their own choices. You, your job is only to, to tell them and to convey the message. The rest it is up to them. You cannot make them do anything. Yet he had this inside, yet outside he was soft. He would always be soft. And his heart was clean for everybody. He would forgive everybody. So, so what, what do we learn for ourselves? To check ourselves every day. May Allah Ta'ala make us all those people. May Allah Ta'ala forgive our shortcomings and make us like that. And don't make an issue out of small mistakes. Yes, we are all human. We will, we will make mistakes. Others will make mistakes around us. And when mistakes happen, then forgive in a way as if it never happened. Right? Fa'afu anhu. Allah SWT is saying pardon them in a way that as if it, it didn't even happen. Right? And... Um, and and we know that these were the qualities of the Prophet ﷺ because other places in the Quran, like in Surah Al Taba, the ninth surah of the Quran, ayah number 128, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, There has certainly come to you a messenger from among yourself. Grievous to him is what you suffer. He is concerned over you. And to the believers, he is kind and merciful. Right. So and even in the previous books, Abdullah bin Amr, he said that he had read in the previous about the final prophet who would come. One of the things that was said in the previous books, meaning the Torah and the Injil, the Old Testament and, and the New Testament, it was said that this prophet who would come, he is not severe, harsh. He's not obscene in the marketplace or dealing evil for evil. Rather, he forgives and pardons. Right. Uh, the one who can forgive big, big mistakes, that's the one who has the big heart, big heart. May Allah Ta'ala protect our hearts and make us like that. That is pleasing to him, right? Like a person with a small heart cannot do big, big, big actions, not do big things, right? So what do we need? We need our tongues to be smaller and our hearts to be bigger, right? That it's, it's OK. What happened happened, but it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world, right? 100% quality is unachievable. 
by anybody, right? It's not possible that there are no mistakes. Even Sahabas, even the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu they were human. They did make mistakes and none of us can have perfect people in our team, our families. None of us can have for perfect people, not even a single person. It's not possible, right? Computers can be assembled in a way that we want them, not human beings. Human beings cannot be how we exactly want them, right? We, ha we have to uh, we have to still be with them and we have to uh, ignore a lot of things. We have to carry on and everything, right? Human beings make mistakes, right? And even people who make mistakes, even then uh, things can be, work can be done with them as long as they're genuine people, right? They're genuine people. They're not munafikin, they're not fasikin. They're genuine people, but mistakes happen from them, right? Mistakes happen. Not that they keep doing the mistakes, but mistakes happen and they are, they're ready to uh, like, make amends for those mistakes, right? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even he even forgave, forgave the people like Hind and Vashi, right? Hind was the, the lady who um, who asked for his um, uncle to be killed in the Battle of Uhud. She was the one who mutilated the body and made necklace out of the fingers of uh, the, of Hamza radiallahu anhu, right? And Vashi is the one who killed uh, Hamza he, he, the, later on in the Sira, we know both of them accepted Islam and the Prophet ﷺ forgave both of them. He forgave both of them even, right? And uh, no punishment was given to them after Fatah Makkah when um, he could, he was victorious and he could have punished them, but he never punished them, right? So what do we learn is we don't become lenient on ourselves. We don't keep ignoring our own shortcomings but we forgive others. A, a believer, we need to keep, keep a strong account of our own self. We need to have to keep the working on our own taqwa, keep working on what I should be doing right, what I can do better, what are the mistakes that I did and what can I correct and everything. And for others, we forgive them. We do the best that they can. We convey the right thing in the right way and then we keep moving on. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, one, you forgive them. Second, is not just you forgive them, Ya Rasulullah, and this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making the Prophet say in front of the companions. So we can imagine how the companions would have felt at this time. That they're listening that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding the Prophet and he's telling the what is going in, inside the Prophet's heart. And he's commanding the Prophet that you have to, in public, that you have to forgive, you, you forgive them. And in addition, you seek forgiveness for them. Like now it is, it is okay that if somebody has hurt us that we forgive them. Yes, it OK, fine, I, I forgive like, OK, carry on. Let's let's forget it. Let's move on with our life. Like I cannot stay in that that negative zone all the time. Like let, let's just forget it, right? But it is very hard to seek forgiveness from Allah for them. That Ya Allah, you also forgive them. Now that requires a, a different kind of love, right? That you you forgive them and you ask Allah to forgive them. You make dua for them, right? And when we make dua for somebody, it is very hard to stay upset for with them, even if they have done mistake. Because when you're making dua for them, you're saying, oh, ya Allah, forgive them. Like you, you will, your heart will become clean for them anyway, right? So it is a quality of the believers. It's a quality of the Muslims that we make dua for each other. Making dua for each other, that creates love amongst each other. So we should, and we there is no harm in asking somebody, please make dua for me. There's no harm is in asking uh, other people and like people that we love that can you please make dua for me or make dua for my children or make dua for my family and make dua. There's no harm in that, right? And and we should make dua for others um, as well and uh, we should make dua for uh, people who are close to us. And um, being soft doesn't mean that we just keep smiling and no matter what good or bad happens, we don't even say anything. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ was very soft but firm at the same time as well. He was he wouldn't he wouldn't tolerate. Um, wrong as well, right? And this quality, like we, we said, it was mentioned in other books as well. He was firm on the principles as well, right? So, um, um, and, and this we know is a huge rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, this is expected from anybody who has, who, star, who wants to do the work of the deen, who wants to work for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to develop this quality amongst themselves. And if we see for it also, for example, when there are big storms, Right when they, um, let's say a big storm happens, or um, you know, like uh, um, what happens in a big storm? There are um, there are big trees that fall down when any storm comes. We see that there are so many trees that have fallen down at different places and everything. But small and soft, uh, soft shrubs which are there, they are able to survive. Why is that? And the most thing that is able, the most vegetation that is able to survive the most during even the storms is the grass. Why the grass? 
because the grass is soft and resilient. Like when we walk on the grass, it bends and everything. It becomes it's soft. It's not harsh at all. And then when somebody goes, it, it goes back up again. Right? There's resilience in a grass. So when we look at the grass, what we learn is the softness. Anything which is soft is able to survive more. Right? And for one, like we said, is the opposite of that. And the Prophet ﷺ was not like that. Right? He was, um, you know, despite everything, he was able to forgive people and move on. May Allah Ta'ala make us like that too. Right? Because leniency and forgiveness, what it does is it creates mutual goodwill and trust amongst people. It makes the system coherent and strong, like like people won't shatter, people won't move away. So for any group to stay together, this this quality is very essential um, uh, for for each other. But at times there there is uh, there are things that need to be spoken out. So for example, um, in health, like for good health, the basic requirement is healthy food. Like most of the time, we need to have healthy food. But sometimes medicine is needed to restore health as well. So similarly in social life, the political life, the basic requirement is leniency, but at certain times firmness and severity may be necessary due to some need of emergency or something and everything, right? So just being lenient, just just as a disclaimer, being lenient doesn't mean that uh, we we let uh, people, you know, we, we let just people get away with anything and everything, but it is the behavior which has to be lenient and then uh, sometimes, sparingly, uh, things might need to be called out, but uh, may Allah ta'ala grant us the hikmah for that, right? And there's also a hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, told us that through the Prophet sallam, that if people did not sin, then Allah will bring another people who will sin and he will forgive. He loves forgiveness so much, right? Um, the uh, Every son of Adam is a sinner, and the best of those sinners are those who repent, so mistakes will happen from everybody, but we repent and we forgive others too, right? And sometimes loss is important to to keep the humility alive, to keep the humility alive. Because if everybody is doing everything correct all the time, then arrogance is very um, like people get arrogant even when they're making mistakes. Like we see that people making mistakes and being arrogant while making mistakes. So if imagine if we were not making any mistakes, then how much arrogance um, we were capable of? May Allah forgive all of us. Right. So um, again, uh, we don't uh, we seek forgiveness from for somebody else, and this expands our heart, right? And this is this is a pinnacle of how we behave. And then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says also, first you forgive them, second you seek forgiveness from them, and then wa shawirhum fil amr. Then meaning shawirhum um, meaning you take mashwara, like uh, and mashwara is very important in our deen. In fact, there's a whole ayah called uh, there's a whole surah called. Uh, Surah Ashura in the Quran, because the taking opinions from others has a lot of importance in our deen. Right, consultation is extremely important principle for um, social order, for political um, things, for administrative things, matters, all these kind of things. Right, and why is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taking the opinion of others? So if if we think about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he he was getting wahi from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. He was talking to Jibreel, the angel Jibreel. He's talking to that. Yet, why is he taking opinion from other human beings, right? Why is he doing that? Now, just to understand that there are two kinds of matters that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to deal with. One on which instructions were given directly through Wahi. On these, no opinion was needed. For example, how much zakat should be given? It is 2.5%. This is what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said. That is it. When and how to pray, right? Like you have to pray fajr. You have to pray two rakat in fajr. You have to pray four rakat in suhr. This is it. Like you know, there's no mashwara in this. There's no changing the number of rakat that we are praying. There's no change in this. There's no change in the the time of hajj. There's no change in how how you are um, how much uh, is going to be the month of Ramadan and how much you're going to fast um, from what time to what time what you're allowed to eat what you're what you uh, what you're allowed during the fast what you're not allowed during the fast that's all decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but other matters things about which either no clear command has been received from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or if a command has been given but the question of how to put it into effect uh, still needs to be settled. So in that those matters, he fought. Uh, he sought the uh, mashwara of people. He sought the opinion of other companions, and then he he went ahead accordingly. Right. So for example, at the time of before Uhud, he sought everybody's opinion: should we fight in the city or should we go out? At the time of Badr, he asked the, uh, their opinion: okay, where should we camp? Where should we set up our camp? Should the prisoners uh, be executed, prisoners of war, or should they be spared? 
at the time of uh, the incident of if when the uh, when people made um, rumors about his wife and uh, Aisha, our mother Aisha really on her. He saw the opinion of other people. Okay, he he called them and he asked them. Okay, what is your opinion? He asked the maid. Okay, what do you think and everything? Though like this is somebody he loves, but yet he has a position, so he deals with that opinion. At the time of Khandak, the Battle of Trench. He saw the opinion of the Sahabas, what should I do? And one person gave an opinion, Salman bin Farsi, that uh, in our place, when we have an, a war, we dig a trench all around to protect our city from the people, and that was followed. Right At Hudebiya, when there was, uh, he took the mashwara from the Sahaba, should we go to fight or should we stay and not fight? Right, And he sought all these opinions. So what does, what does um, taking opinion from others do? It, it shows that you respect and value others. It brings the community together. It builds the community. And sometimes when we seek opinion, even when it's not needed, we um, we can make this intention for me and you. We can make this intention that we are following a sunnah, that it was the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I will seek an opinion and everything and may Allah Ta'ala accept from me. So it becomes an ibadah then. It becomes, a, um, uh, it, it, it gets written down for us as a means of worship, as a means of trying to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As opposed to this, a dictator, what does a dictator do? They do not seek the opinion of others. And what, what happens eventually, when somebody is able to revolt, they revolt and people disperse away. Right? For, for a dictator, even his own people, for a dictator, they don't really like him. They just like the benefits that they're getting because in, they are in the they are with the person who's in power. So they just um, follow him because of that. But as soon as they get a chance, they 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 disperse away, right? So Shura in Islam has a lot of uh, a lot of rewards, and uh, the Prophet ﷺ told us to the effect that the person who does mashwara will never be disappointed. Like they will never be like um, you know like it, it will give some benefits basically, right? And um, so um, we we make the shura, we, we take the advice from people. And uh, how do we seek advice? For me and you, what does that mean? We choose the best people. One is we don't seek advice from TikTok or social media or like uh, just random people who don't know what they're talking about. We choose the best people. We choose people who are intelligent. We choose people who are capable. And then we take their opinion or and then they then apply the opinion according to what's the best um, uh, way to apply it, right? Or um, before announcing anything, we check with the people whom it will impact, right? If we are making a decision and that decision is going to impact some other people, let's say we are making a decision for ourselves and our work, a husband's making a decision for his work, and that is going to impact the life of his wife and his children and everything. And before announcing, he's like, okay, he discusses it with them and everything that, and then he makes this intention that, yeah, I'm going to follow a sunnah. And it, that, that discussion becomes um, an act of worship for him. Right, for for so for um, similarly a wife when she discusses that okay I'm I'm going to go uh, I have to go to this friend's place or I'm doing something and she discusses she talks to her husband about it she tells him about it she has this discussion then inshallah that becomes a uh, uh, an act of worship for her as well because and she sees the reward from Allah subhanahu wa taala and even for no, normal day to day things and also when we do mashwara what it does is it makes the other person feel valued they f they uh, so. In in in, ta, in the context of the Battle of Uhud, these people who are feeling guilty, who are feeling sad, who are feeling embarrassed, who's, who are feeling like they cannot even make eye contact with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is telling them through the Prophet himself that the Prophet has forgiven you. He's going to seek forgiveness for you. He's going to consult you in your matters, even though your mashwara. Some people gave a mashwara which led to all these harm that they wanted to go out and fight. They didn't want to stay inside. And that was a wrong opinion, but he's not going to hold you for that. Sometimes some people might give one opinion who might lead to disaster, but then we don't be like, you said this, you know, that's why all this happened, right? Um, we don't do that. Like the same person might give another opinion that might be really good, right? So we don't, uh, so when we we take their opinion again, we make them feel valued. We make them feel like uh, they're important and everything, right? And finally, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and when you have decided the matter, when you have done your mashwara, and, and first mashwara we always do is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is what? Which is istikhara. Uh, we, we pray istikhara. We, when we have a decision to make, we pray istikhara. We ask Allah ta'ala for goodness in whatever. Then we discuss with people who either will be affected or who have intelligent, um, uh, who, who have knowledge about that matter or something. We discuss with them and everything, and then we make a decision. And after we have made a decision and all this, then, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلَ اللَّهِ 
then when you have decided, then once you've made a decision, then put your trust in Allah. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us? That then you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So Quran is teaching us like how to deal literally our daily life, right? So what does tawakkul mean? Tawakkul means that, um, again, it's a heavy word. It's a deep word. But what does it mean is that um, one time a person came to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said uh, he got he had his camel and the camel we know is the most prized possession of um, somebody in a desert, right? So he had this camel. He, the camel was outside and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I left my camel outside. I didn't tie my camel and I trust Allah. And the Prophet said, no, you go back, you tie your camel, meaning that you don't want the camel to run away, you tie your camel, and then you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? That we do the best that we can in a situation, and then we say, okay, now I did my best, and now the matter is in Allah's hands. He will do for with me, and I will accept whatever he does with me. And tawakkul means, you know, one of the scholars he said in a very beautiful way is that uh, tawakkul gives a sense of peace inside to a person. And what does tawakkul do? Tawakkul means to become towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like a dead body is in the hands of someone giving usul to it. Right? That uh, they can turn um, the body whichever way they want. They, they clean the body. The, the, a dead person cannot do anything with the body. So it's like whatever decision Allah makes for me is going to be for my best, right? So that is tawakkul. Like I do my best. I do my due diligence. I do whatever I can do, whatever is in my power to do for myself, for my children, for my family, for my community, for my deen. I'm, I do whatever I'm able to do. And then I leave the matter in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have this tawakkul. I have this, this faith, this belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take care of my matters, right? So even when we go for Hajj, for example, we are told take things for the way, take things for the way. There is there's adab of tawakkul that when you go with people and you're going with a group, you're traveling with a group, then take some 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 money, some food, some things for the way, so that when you're in in a group when you're traveling, you're not sitting in a group and you keep asking for food for other people. Or you have to keep asking other people for stuff. Take some provision with you, and then also have your trust in Allah subhanahu wa taala because no matter how much we do. We can do all the due diligence. We can do all the planning that's possible. We can do everything. Yet things might not turn out to be how we want them to turn out. Right. But even when that happens, then we have to make sure that we rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how do we rely? Right. The, the, what does reliance mean uh, in true sense? It means uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains to us in the next ayah, if Allah helps you, there is none to overcome you. So once I do this, I have like, Ya Allah, I need your help. And if Allah helps me, then there is nobody who can overpower me. Right. So then anything that we happen that happens on the way we on the path, whatever we are trying to do, it shouldn't disappoint us. It shouldn't make us hopeless. Right. And even in Uhud, for example, 10 percent of the people are martyrs. Yes, it's a big number. 70 out of 700 were martyred. But the feeling amongst the people could have been the whole cause of Islam is in danger. They, it could have led to weakness. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that don't be sad. Don't don't worry. If Allah is with you, no one can overcome you. Yes, you have faced harm and everything, but it won't overcome you. Right. And um, if he forsake you, khadala, khadal, like as uh, khadal means to leave at the time of need. Right? When somebody is in need of something, then to leave. And what who does khadal a lot? Shaitan. Shaitan, uh, what Shaitan does is, the, what the devil does is, he he keeps inciting people to do, you know, do this. I'm with you. Do this. Do this. And he incites people to do sins, to do wrong things and everything. But right at the time of need, when he's like, okay, I did this. Now, now you are here with me, right? He's like, no, I just told you to do it, but you did it. Like, even on the day of judgment, he'll be like, I had no power over you. I had no control of you, over you. Only thing I could do was whisper to you. You are the one who followed. So now blame yourself, right? Even on the day of judgment, although he was the one who was inciting people all the time, but he would, he would go away uh, at that time, right? So if Allah forsakes us, if Allah leaves us at the time when we need him, then where will we go? We have nowhere to go. We have nobody to help after him. So how do we seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There are four things that we, we, we learn in our deen that um, that call the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One is to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to, uh, to follow as, to include as much sunnah practices, practices of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our life as possible. Do not 
do not let your heart get attached to the disbelievers or the practices of the disbelievers. Yes, we want good for everybody, but do not make them your allies in the sense. Don't seek guidance from them. Don't seek um, guidance from people who don't believe in God and everything. Right. And do Amar bil Maruf and Nakib Anil Mulkan, meaning uh, call people towards good. And the more difficult of that is stop um, stop people from the wrong things. And the fourth thing is that uh, amongst each other develop unity and um, you know, like uh, work on developing the unity amongst each other, right? And uh, when we are doing anything in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it cannot, we cannot go ahead and do it if we keep looking at people. We have to. Yes, we live amongst people. We behave amongst people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach us how to behave amongst people. But then our eyes have to be towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like we have to live in the dunya, but live for the akhirah, right? Um, live with the people but for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, when we have this yaqeen inside that the Rabb, who is the in charge of uh, the whole universe, who's everything, if he is with me, then nobody can overpower me. Then even if the Prophet ﷺ told us, even if the whole world, all the human beings and all the mankind and the jinn kind, they all get together to harm you, they cannot harm you even to the prick of a pin if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't will for it to be so. And if everybody joins together to benefit you, they cannot benefit you if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not already willed for it to do so, right? So what's the difference between a, a believer and a disbeliever? That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. That the believers, what is what what makes the believers apart? What 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 uh, makes the believer set apart from a disbeliever is that a kafir, a person who doesn't believe in Allah, a person who doesn't believe in God, their trust, their reliance is upon themselves or the resources around them or the powers around them or the things that they have or the resources that they have. But a mu'min, a believer, their reliance is only on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because what they understand is that the real strength and power comes only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any power that we see other than Allah's is just an illusion. Any power that we see other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just an illusion. And that's what we learn when we say la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. La hawla, there is no change in a condition. Wa la quwwata, and there is no power to create that change illa billah, except with Allah. So our iman necessarily leads us, when we have iman, the next step would be when we profess to iman, when we work on our iman, it leads for us to put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and any claim that any of us makes to believe in Allah, but we don't, we refuse to put our trust in him only shows that our claim was not solid anyway. Our claim was hollow. But when our claim is strong, then our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also strong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those people who are strong, who are able to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who take, uh, who take lesson from what we are supposed to do and who take lesson from the behavior of the Prophet ﷺ. We don't make role models from other people and um, other situations. We look at the Prophet ﷺ. We look at the role models that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made for us. And we look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help at all times. Subhanakallahumma ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka, astaghfiruka, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, just as he united us as sisters in Islam in this world, may he reunite us as sisters in Islam on the day of judgment under the shade of his throne when there will be no shade except his. And then once again in Jannatul Firdaus, any goodness that has come from today's talk is from Allah and Allah alone because he's the owner of all goodness. And any shortcomings, any mistakes are for myself because I'm human and open to mistake. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive. And still accept this coming together. May Allah make it this a means of increasing our Iman and those of the Iman of anybody who listens to this at any time in the future. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be Shafi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be Kafi for all of us. May Allah ta'ala heal all of us. May Allah ta'ala heal everyone in our families, uh, in our loved ones who have any kind of uh, situations that uh, anything that they're dealing with. May Allah ta'ala grant them full complete, quick and complete shifa and keep all of us safe and healthy. Ameen ya rahman rahimeen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.